I'm not sure how to properly apologize to you all, but I've done my absolute best to give you the best experience. I tried using the narrator I usually rely on, but unfortunately, it's not working today. So, I had to use a different one. I tested several narrators online, but I found their voices weren't quite what I was looking for. So for today, I hope you'll bear with me as I use this narrator instead. I appreciate your understanding. Previously on The Buried History of Old India, we uncovered surprising details about early photos of India, 1850 to 1865, showing large structures covered in soil and vegetation. Why was India seemingly neglected for so long? Some speculate a massive flood event may have contributed. We saw temples and monuments like Jaga Nath Sava and Durga Temple in states of disrepair. The idea that these structures were buried and later excavated, like the Kailasa Temple, leads to questions about the technology used to build them. Local histories are often dismissed as mythology, but they provide alternate explanations, such as celestial beings constructing Elora. The discussion also touches on rock-melting weapons and high-tech ancient sites, like the Manakshi Sundareshwara Temple. Were these places used for energy purposes? The evidence suggests India's ancient structures may have had technological significance far beyond what modern scholars have acknowledged. Anyway, the top parts of the towers are called Kalasha. Wikipedia says, they were used as decorative element placed on top of various types of buildings. Remember that statement. This is an 1860 photo of the temple of Jarapadan. You see, it's all just decorative and ornamental. Nothing to do with tech, ancient antennas, and harvesting atmospheric energy. Wikipedia says, Present in the form of an inverted pot with a point facing the sky, Kulis has are prominent elements of temple architecture. An inverted pot with a point facing the sky? Like satellite dishes? According to the Aitariya Brahmana, a golden kalasha is regarded to represent a sun upon the summit of a deity's dwelling, the temple. Wait what? I thought they were only decorative. You're contradicting yourself, Wikipedia. Most Kulasams are made of metal and some of stone. The view of the Gopuram, Temple Tower, is one of the important rituals of Hindu worship along with view of the Dvaja Stamba, Temple Flag Mast. These Gopurams are usually topped with ornamental Kulasas. Kulasas are consecrated during the Kumbhabishikam ceremony and are venerated during pujas. Well, if they are worshipped, then they're not just decorative. Their meaning goes much deeper. There are four types of kalasas. Singa kalasha, it is shaped like the horn of a bull. Trikalasha, this is a group of three long kalasas. It is mostly used on gopurams and main gates. Madaka kalasha, this kalasha is shaped like pitchers and earthenware pots. It appears as if pots have been placed on top of one another. Gala kalasha, this kalasha is round and has a very small and fine tip on top. Kalasas are mostly made of metal. The main metals used are bronze and copper. In famous temples like Tirupati, noble metals like gold and silver are used. In previous videos I showed how ornaments atop buildings are linguistically related to fire and light. It's no different in Hinduism where Kalasha represents the sun. One of those flagstaffs called Dvaja Stamba. The etymology is fascinating. Stamba is supposed to be the Sanskrit word for staff. But it's also the German word for pole, tree and staff, modern German stam. As I've said, the language of these extraterrestrial and subterrestrial fallen angels, Azuras, Devis, angels, was most certainly a type of German spoken a thousand years ago. This is from Wikipedia. The Dvaja Stamba refers to the flagstaff erected in front of the Mukamapa, front pavilion, of a Hindu temple. The Dvaja Stamba is usually built within the temple walls, Prakara. They are traditionally built of wood and stone, where the wooden variety is often finished with a metal covering, Kavaka. The Dvaja Stamba is a common feature in South Indian temples. Two other objects that are grouped together with this flagstaff are the Bali Pitham, altar for offerings, and the vehicle, Vahana, of the deity to whom the temple is dedicated. Symbolically, these three objects are shields that protect the sanctuary of the temple from the impure and undevoted. A little more is going on than just a flagstaff. The electric pole belongs to the, the altar for offerings, Bali Pitha, Ball Pit, and the Vahana. The three belong together according to Wikipedia. 
I believe the entire temple belongs together as some type of energy or electricity generating device. This is from a Vedic website, Arts of a Dravidian Temple. 1. Gopuram, a formal entrance to the compound of the temple. 2. Bali Pitam, a sacrificial platform to offer naivetyam, Bali offerings. 3. Dwajas Thambam, a flag post at a magnetic point to connect the earth and heavens generally between Garbha Griha and Gopuram. 4. Mundapam Chawadis, used for different rituals related to the Murthy Temple. 5. Vahana Mundapam, space of Vahana of God, Garuda Mundapam for Vishnu and Nandi Mundapam for Shiva, generally facing their masters. 6. Ma Mandapa, a post at a magnetic point to connect earth and heavens? Yeah, I thought so. It's more than just a flag carrier. I guess that's why there are so many flagpoles at every temple. Where is India's more recent history? Peculiar. A lot is known about ancient Indian history, but I learned next to nothing about more recent Indian history. At least not about the things I wanted to know. One example. Gopuram towers have allegedly been around for thousands of years. I had a hard time finding artwork, paintings, drawings, etchings, lithographs of the towers pre-1850. What did these towers look like in the 1600s? 1700s? I came up almost empty. Had nobody ever drawn or painted the towers? That's unlikely. We have thousands of artists showing us buildings around the world, but they are suspiciously absent from India. Try typing South India 1600s or similar into a search engine and you'll see what I mean. Where are the towers? Unless India experienced a hard reset in the early 1800s, this is hard to explain. I think images were gotten rid of because of what they revealed about pre-reset technology. Because we've been reset, we're supposed to have forgotten about all that happened prior. For example, this building, Gaia Bodhi, drawn in 1790, shows a feature that is removed later on. It's barely visible in this image, but more clear here. I'm talking about this. It was there in the 1700s, but it went missing in the 1800s. This 1890s photo shows it in a state of disrepair. Wow, what just a hundred years can do? It looks like the front pavilion has been removed and the top blown off. If you do a little digging, pun intended, you'll find it very common for stuff to be removed from old structures. It was present yesterday. Absent today. This, by the way, is called Temple of Nimanatha on Mount Gurnar. Old India was attacked. Signs of the ancient war between gods and demigods abound. This is Vidhala Temple, 1856. Baladidiya Temple, Nalanda, 1872. Ashoka, or Ashoka Pillar, Delhi. Ashoka is an iron pillar that allegedly doesn't rust. This has made the pillar a popular feature of ancient alien shows and websites around out-of-place artifacts. This is Chitradurga, 1852. This video only scratches a thin layer atop the surface of all that India can offer to researchers. According to Tamil literature, southern India was once part of a sunken continent called Kumari Kandam. Tales of flying vehicles and sci-fi weapons in ancient India abound. Maybe it's time for scholars in southern India to revisit the stuff outsiders called myths. Knowledge dissemination relies on you. Share this video far and wide.